We are in a series right now, it's called The Waters in Which We Swim. If you were to ask a fish, how's the water, they would respond, what's water? Right? Just, this is just the thing. And we realize that as we grow up um, in American culture, we would just ask, what do you mean American culture? And if you ever get the opportunity, and most I know most um, uh, liberal arts colleges require this now, and some programs even at the University of Minnesota requires, if you get the opportunity to do a cross-cultural thing, it's a good thing for you to just learn about other cultures, but more than anything, you'll come back and go, oh my gosh, there's a lot to Americanism I didn't even realize. It was just this water that I was swimming in. If you get a chance to be in another culture, take it. It it is a great opportunity to have uh, this this idea of what, what are the waters that we swim in and, and are they good, are they bad? Do we, how do we think about them? This series uh, was kind of the born or the concept came when I was sitting at the Gospel Coalition and I, uh, they had this big conference in Chicago. And Tim Keller was giving a presentation about this new book that he had just put out called The New City Catechism. And if you're, some of you, some of you raised doing catechism kind of things like that, right? You, you, if you were in that tradition, you'd never raise your hand in church, so yeah, I don't know if you're, you, uh, <laughs> but uh, the New City Catechism is basically questions and answers to faith questions to life questions, and, and that's what catechisms were, and he updated it, uh, and, and good, good thing, but, but p- people were asking him, why do this? Why have uh, a catechism for today's culture? And he said, because... Uh, every moment that people are not in an opportunity where they're thinking of faith matters, they're being catechized into something. And then he gave a few examples. Uh, in fact, some of the examples from this sermon series were some of the ones he used, the one that uh, Chorus talked about, the happiness narrative, and what that means, and, and that you just do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone and it makes you happy, or freedom, where it says, my freedom, what's most important? Uh, and so these things, it just hit me like, man, that... That is really fascinating. And it kind of ruminated in corn I've been talking over the years, and that's where uh, this idea has come from. And it's complicated. It's complicated. Let me give you why it's complicated in, in the words of Jesus. In, in the Gospel of John, it's a fascinating gospel. If you have not had a chance to ever read through uh, one of the four gospels or accounts of Jesus' life, I always encourage people to start with the Gospel of John. I think it's the one where it's written the most plainly. I also think it's the deepest of all the Gospels. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, it has bo- it's kind of a both and. In the Gospel of John, when we get to John chapter 13, well, about halfway in the Gospel, roughly, uh, we're at the last week of Jesus' life. John spends a tremendous amount of time in that. When we get to chapter 17, and I, I wish we had time to go through the whole thing, and I, I commend it to you to look it through. It's this prayer where he's praying to the Father. And he has a lot of different things. It's called his high priestly prayer. If you ever look it up, that's the name of it. And uh, this is part of what he he prays as he's praying to God about his disciples and people who have followed him. He says this, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify, sanctify them by your, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Okay? So here's the deal. You have this, you have the Jesus praying, and he says, they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Okay? So that's interesting. So there's this concept Uh, the world, right? The world. Okay, and he says they're not of the world. Well, yeah, they are. I mean, we're in this world and we're of it, right? But he's saying that there's something different about them. And then he even says, my prayer is that you don't take them out of the world, but that you protect them while they're in this, this world. Okay, and so throughout church history, people have responded in multiple ways. And how do we uh, interact with culture, or how do we interact with what we call the world, right? And there's, there's a lot of different ways. One of the ways would be 
this movement where you get out of it. Don't be of the world. And you kind of create this, and it can go anything from just having very, very close Christian friends, and you don't let anybody in there, to all the way to you'd maybe become Amish, or you'd separate even geographically from other people, right? You isolate yourselves from the rest of it. Well, Jesus clearly said, I pray you don't take them out of the world, right? But you protect them. So this is, some, this is the way some people do it. And I think in some ways we all do this. We isolate ourselves from other folks. Second one is we just fight it, all right? We, we go uh, after this and we attack, all right? This would be uh, what happened in American history around the turn of the 20th century, if you go back to when, when uh, then the, the issue that came up was evolution and that they weren't gonna teach anymore that God created the world in schools and in the 1920s and thereafter, there was kind of this movement that kind of started to fight against and fight. And these people were called fundamentalists uh, and so they were fighting fundamentalists, which is interesting if you've been to a fundamentalist church, there's not a whole lot of fun that goes on there. In fact, they kind of kind of ban fun, but the, the, idea, <laughs> the, the idea there is we need to fight against what's out there. Culture does these things and it's just bad, and we need to, we are on the, it creates an us and a them mentality. The complete flip to that is just to completely simulate into the world, just to simulate, you know, where it's the culture is Borg, and you miles of the, you know, resistance is futile. Anybody? Anybody? There we go. Both, both my, my uh, Star Trek friends there are clapping their hands. But okay, so, the, but the idea is that you just look at culture and you just kind of tag Jesus onto it to quote the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right by me, you know, and so it's this idea that, that uh, we just kind of go with the world as it is. But what, what we're gonna advocate for and what we're talking about in this series and what hope has tried to do in its entire history and really what a stream of people right around the 1940s and the 1950s, uh, this stream of people started realizing, yes, we are not of the world, but we're in the world and we need to be good citizens and we need to interact with the world. How do we do that? And this, it, it gave, there's this, the, the, the debate in the 1920s or even before that was what are they called modernists or what today would perhaps be called liberal theologians which didn't take the Bible seriously and those who said, yes, we do. And we have these, these fundamentals that we agree to. If you're a follower of Jesus, you would agree to all of them in the 1920s. You would, you would have been a fundamentalist in those days. But then the, that kind of that passed on and the final fundamentalist kind of said, it's kind of fun to fight. Who should we fight with? How about each other? And so they just kept going, right? And so there was a split there in fundamentalism which gave rise to, and I'm gonna use a phrase that meant something in the 1940s and 50s that today means something else. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, right? Uh, it's called evangelicalism. Right? In the 1950s, this group splits out of fundamentalism called evangelicalism, and what they're doing is the fourth thing, what I would call... They learn from culture, but they filter it. They're critical of culture in the, in, the, in the right way to use the word critical. In other words, we're gonna think critically about things, but we're not just gonna point our fingers and think we're better than them because that denies the very essence of our faith. Our faith says that we're all on level ground before the cross, so we're gonna have this, a sense of humility, but we're also gonna examine things and say, is this really the best thing? Is this the best thing in our culture? Now, I know that word evangelicalism really kind of means fundamentalism today, almost, as you talk to people in media and all that thing. So we don't use that word around here very much, but historically, that's how it rose up. And so that's what we're advocating in this series. How do we look at these cultural things we're hearing? We're calling them dogmas. We're hearing cultural dogmas that must be believed and saying, what what can we learn from this? And honestly, as followers of Jesus, what needs to get filtered out? What doesn't work, okay? So this is, as we used to say in my second grade teacher, you gotta put your thinking caps on. He said, go like this. He always had to tie them on. I don't know why, like thinking caps would blow off or something, but he always had to tie it on, then no one had a beard like this, so it'd get caught in that. But the one we're going after today is called the American Sovereign Self, the Identity Narrative 
Or to put it just more simply, it's you just need to be true to yourself. Don't let anyone else tell you, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay? We're gonna look at that, look at the good, bad, and the ugly of that that this morning. And I am a kid in a candy store this morning, so I, I hope you are as excited as I am. All right, let's first talk about understanding the narrative. Let's look at this historically a little bit from history standpoint. And I'm gonna lean in on uh, uh, the Pope. The Pope has written some really good stuff on this, uh, Tim Keller. And um, <laughs> there we go. And uh, he, uh, he is about eight or nine pages in this book that he's written called Preaching the, uh, it's something about uh, communicating faith in an age of skepticism. And it's interesting that it's a great book. It has very little to do with how to preach. It has more to do with what's going on in our society and what are some of the beliefs in our society and how can the biblical truths come and interact with them in a helpful way that people can hear it. It's a great book. He's got about eight good pages on this particular narrative, which I've boiled down to into eight slides, okay? So I'm gonna give you four now and then a few later and that kind of a thing. So let me just read a little bit of this to help you to understand uh, what this narrative is really saying. What does this American sovereign self or the American uh, identity narrative saying to us? Many argue, this is Tim speaking, I'm just reading. Many argue that the most fundamental of the late modern narratives is that of identity, that we must discover our deepest desires and longings and then do all we can to realize them, regardless of constraint or opposition. Sociologist Robert Bella, now if you're at all into this stuff, Robert Bella is kind of your guy. In the, in the 80s, he wrote a book called Habits of the Heart. And it went to American culture and said, what, what drives American culture? Not necessarily a Christian, uh, uh, I don't know where his faith matters is, but he doesn't come at it from that perspective. He just comes at it from a sociological perspective saying, in history, what's unique in the American mindset, all right? And he has called this narrative the expresses, expressive individualism in an article he wrote in 1998. All right, so he updates this and says, this is what's going on. Tim Keller calls it, and I love this title, the sovereign self. In other words, I am kind of the captain of my ship, and I decide, all right? We should start by recognizing the great good ushered in by the modern emphasis on the individual, all right? So he goes on to give some examples. One of the examples he gives of, is of his grandfather, who was born in 1880. He's born in Italy, and his options as a, as a kid in Italy in 1880 were he could become a priest, he could take on the family trade, or he could go into the military. Those are his three options. That's it. And he said to himself, like a lot of people were saying who emigrated here to the United States, I'm going to go to the land of opportunity, right? So they came here, many, many people have, uh, and still do, coming here to this thing, I want I want something more and different for me, right? That's where this cultural dogma is, it, they got a, it's got a lot of good there. There are good things to look inside and say, what are my passions, what are my interests? What could I do for a career that would be great? Those are very, very, very positive things. He'll go on though to say, uh, Christianity has always seen the importance of the heart and its loves. Augustine, or Augustine, matters if you're Protestant or Catholic, I guess, confessions represented an innovative, an innovation in the history of human thought, a thoroughgoing examination of inner motivations and desires. Unlike the thinkers of classical antiquity, Christians regarded emotions as something not to be ignored or simply suppressed, but instead to be examined and redirected toward God. Much of the modern understanding of the feelings and the self has grown from these Christian roots. However, in, uh, in the, uh, the new late modern narrative, however, goes beyond merely understanding and directing our own passions that to, to enthroning them. Now, identity is not realized, as in traditional societies, by sublimating or our individual desires for the good of our family and people, Instead, we become ourselves only by asserting our individual desires against society, by expressing our feelings and fulfilling our dreams regardless of what anyone says. And then he goes on to say, you cannot get significance through self-recognition. It must come in great measure from others. In the end, you can't name yourself or bless yourself. You can't ultimately say to yourself, 
I don't care that everyone I know thinks I'm a monster. I love myself, and that's all that matters. That would not convince us of our worth unless we were mentally unsound. We need someone from outside to say we are of great worth. And the greater the worth of the person telling us so, the more powerful that recognition is to our identity formation. So if we try to authentic, uh, uh, authenticate and validate ourselves, we place ourselves in the infinite loop of a delusion that will lead to either narcissism or self-loathing. Okay, that's the American sovereign self. Kind of thinking about it a little bit more historically. Now let me, let me give you a little... I, I, more, more cultural references that would be, you know, you would land a little more with you. Just, just, just work with me here for a minute, because I know a couple of these are very old. But first one, Sammy Davis Jr., right? I got to be me. I got to be me. Now, I don't want Sammy Davis Jr. to be anybody else but Sammy Davis Jr. That's not what he's singing about. He's singing about this, I've got to be me, I've got to be free from constraints and anything else. I am the one who knows me, and I have to become me. Let me go back uh, two or three years before that to Bill Shakespeare. He said, this above all, to thine own self be true. Right? There's a lot of greatness there, right? You're the only one that really knows what's going on. That's true. However, does that put me at the center of the universe as far as defining who I am and what I am? And it must follow as the night, the day, thou canst not be, then be false to any man. All right? Now, to go where angels fear to tread, let me give you one more. And it's the movie Frozen. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. If you don't like this one, Walt Disney at Hope Community Church, okay? So, but there's a song in the movie Frozen which really highlights this. The main character comes out and sings this song called Let It Go. And in that, they sing these words. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small and the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through, right? Sounds good. No right no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let's think about this just for a second. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go, let it go. I am one with the wind and sky. Let it go, let it go. You'll never see me cry. Here I stand and here I stay. Let the storm rage on. Now, before I get a lot of hate mail, because I know you're like, I was raised on Frozen. You go on quoting Lion King all you want. I'm like frozen. Before I get that email, there's a lot of truth here, okay? There's a lot of truth in this. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But listen to that line. I, I define what's right. I define what's wrong. I define what the rules are. I'm free. So, how do we then filter the cultural dogma of the sovereign self. Now, I wanna do something here. This may seem like a bunny trail. <laughs> Everything I say must seem like a bunny trail, but there's actually an insert, and you can follow along what I'm trying to do here. The, the, uh, the it's very small print today, sorry. But the, uh, how do we filter this cultural dogma of the sovereign self? And, and I wanna walk you through something that I found extremely fascinating when I was at uh, the Acts 29 Midwest Conference on Thursday and Friday of this week. Fascinating. And it wasn't the guy's point, but he read this passage and I went, that'll preach. So th you're getting his sermon, but he didn't really preach this. But, but he quoted from 1 Corinthians 1. So what's happening in, in the place where the Apostle Paul is writing in Corinth is there's a, it's, Corinth is Greece. Even if you're just a, a, a casual philosopher or you've taken anything about ancient uh, Greece, you knew that they loved their philosophy, they loved their logic, they loved to think through all the, all the great philosophers, Socrates and, and uh, um, Pl Plato and all those, you know, whatever, they come out of Greece, right? And so, <laughs> so we turn, a lot of, that's what we learned on the Iron Range. Anyway, the, uh, they, they come out and they have all these different philosophies, right? 
And, and, and Paul is now teaching the, the Corinthians about the gospel, and a lot of, there's a lot of pushback by the, the, the philosophers of the day in Corinth who are pushing back saying, that's stupid, right? Doesn't make any sense. And listen to how he engages culture here. He filters it. He says this. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who also believe it's the power of God. For it is written, and he quotes from Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of, of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God... The world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. So the apostle Paul himself, being a Jewish person, would say, every time I try to convince Jews, they would say, show me signs. Do things that are miraculous that would overcome this silly thing about a crucified Messiah. That's ridiculous. And Greeks want it all to make sense. They want it all logical, right? But we preach Christ crucified which does make sense, and it's a huge sign, but it's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And then he he drops this. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. Okay, you guys want wisdom, he's saying to the Corinthians? You guys want wisdom Let me tell you what, Jesus Christ has become the ultimate smart thing ever said in the history of ever. It is wisdom personified. And and then Paul says, let me tell you, let me unpack that for you. What is God's wisdom for the human heart? He lists it in three words. And literally, I was listening to this guy talk, and then all of a sudden he read these three words, and I went, I didn't really hear much anything else. He said, righteousness, holiness, and redemption, right? There it is. He has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Now, let me, I'll, I'll unpack those in just a minute, but just, he says, therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay, let's back up here. Those three words. You want to be wise, Corinthians? You want to be really wise? You want to know what smart is? Here's the smartness of God. Here's all the logic of God. Here's the signs from God. Guess what? It's about our righteousness, So the human heart craves to be found righteous, to be found right, that we are okay. We did a whole sermon series on I'm okay in Jesus. I what my what the human heart wants, what's the smartest thing I can know is that I am okay with an almighty God. And that happens in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He takes the penalty for me, and I get his righteousness. Second thing, holiness. I want to be found clean. I want to be found uh, whole. There's something within the human heart that says that would be the best thing ever that I could be found holy and right. And in Jesus Christ, not only does he forgive my sins, but he washes me. He changes me. I am in him, and in him I am completely and utterly forgiven and made whole and clean. And then redemption. The human heart deeply desires to know to know that the one who created him the almighty god looks down upon them and says i'm taking you back home you are mine i'm taking you and i'm adopting you into my family son or daughter you are redeemed and brought back in and paul says and he just drops the verse and walks off the stage and says that's what wisdom is that's what wisdom is that's how we filter this stuff we do, do like the Apostle Paul did here, and we say, what about this cultural narrative is good and true, and how does that, as I take it, and I try to filter it through, what comes through out here that's still true? So with that said, let's, let's evaluate biblical human identity. 
biblical human identity. You get that in four parts in our story of Scripture. The first part is the creation of human identity. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, 28, I'm gonna read that one as well today. Uh, God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the, all the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So what's, what's going on here? God says that what's unique about humanity, what gives us identity, is we are made in the image of God. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a variety of things you can get from that. Whole big theological books are written about this, but let's just take the simple ones. The first one is, in pagan society, they would, uh, you would have a, a pagan god and then you would make an image of the pagan god. Uh, people, when they worshiped the images, they weren't claiming that the, the idol or whatever was the god, it just was an image of the god. And our God says, right in the Ten Commandments, do not do that. Don't be making images of other gods, but don't even make images of me because you are my image. You wanna see something about me? You look at each other. You want to see what an image is, it's, it's us. So when we look at human beings, you have an, an image or a reflection or a likeness of God. Now, you're not God. You didn't hear me? You, yeah, please tweet that, right? You are not God, Steve Treichler, right? But you are like God. You're in the image of God. And he goes on to show that there's dignity and value to every single human being because of that, they have a role. They are to, to be the ones that steward the entire earth, unlike any other thing. And I, I love other things in, in our beautiful world. Uh, I have a beagle. She's great. She does not, well, she kind of rules our house, but she does not rule the world. She, that's not, she doesn't have that, and she's, she's not made in the image of God. She's part of creation, but she's not that. Now, so, every, that's the creation of human identity. But, we're not the thing, we're the image of the thing. And if you think of, change the metaphor, hang with me here, if you think of a mountain, this actually works, imagine in both buildings right now, if you think of, of, of a mountain, and then you have the shadow, we don't want to worship the shadow. We want to look at the mountain. Shouldn't worship mountains either, but you get the idea. You, you, you wouldn't go to Colorado, turn your back to a mountain and go, look at the shadow. That's awesome. Give me a selfie with the shadow, right? You don't do that. You look at the mountain. So we're the shadow. God is a mountain. There's a dependent relationship there. And that's how identity gets lost. Genesis chapter 3. I really want to focus in on verse four, but maybe some of you have never heard this. Let me read it in context. This is in the Garden of Eden. They're living there. Everything is great, but then everything goes south. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from, the tree, from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, that's not what he said. He, he, he said, we may, may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, or you must not touch it or you will die. And here comes the great deception. You will not certainly die, liar. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. That's true. And you'll be like God. That's half true. Knowing good and evil. That's, that's the deception in the garden. Do you see it? What's the deception? The deception is that I won't die but I had this relationship with God where I was dependent on him, and now I can actually become a bud with God. We're just chums. He's my homeboy. We're, we're hanging out. I will be like God. In Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, God is the one who says what's good and what's not good. But now I could be that. I would know good and bad. I get to be like him. I get to be 
the sovereign self. So they do it. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. See, it's a true statement. And they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings from themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hide, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We're not like this. I'm running away from you now. I'm ashamed. That's the lie. The sovereign self denies the fact that God is the one who defines things. And I'm actually created of God to live in that kind of relationship. It denies that. And so what happens is, it, there's a confusion on who we are, and we also have a corruption as a result. That is not the end of the story, though. Jesus Christ comes on the scene and changes everything. John chapter 3, the reinstatement of human identity. Jesus is going to hang out with a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And this guy's a member, let me just read this, he's the member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, so as not to be seen and not to be embarrassed, because he's, he's part of this religious community, and now we're checking this Jesus out. He comes out and he throws Jesus a compliment. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing with, if God were not with him. And Jesus replies exactly to what Nicodemus needs to hear, but not what his words said in any way, shape, or form, Right? How are you doing? You seem like really an uh, important person. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Okay? So this is, this is Jesus, by the way. And, and if you often wonder why Jesus answers your prayer the way he does, it's because he's not praying your words, he's praying what you really need. And then you go, I, I, I prayed that I would get to know you better. Why did you bring this hard thing in my life? Huh? Huh? I'm answering your prayer. I don't want it answered that way. Don't care. I'm answering it that way. So he, this is what he does with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus does a face palm and says, <laughs> very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You heard it, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it is from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And I love Nicodemus' honesty. He just says, how now, brown cow? What, what, what are you saying? Look at Jesus' answer. He says, you're Israel's teacher. You know the Old Testament. This is what it's exactly what it's talked about. And you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you do not, people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How will then you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. This goes back to Numbers chapter 21 when the people of Israel were complaining to God just bitterly and God says, that's it, and he sends a bunch of poisonous snakes and then they cry out and say, rescue us, us from the poisonous snakes and God tells Moses, here's the deal. Go to a state fair, put a, put a, a snake on a stick and I want you to hold that snake up, and wherever a person's bit, miles away, if they want to be healed, they have to walk all the way there, and they have to trust me that this, that if they just look at the snake, they'll be healed. It's a strange thing. And Jesus says in the same way, maybe you don't understand what a man on a cross, man on a stick, would mean for you, but you just look at it, and you say yes to him, that everyone believes in him may have eternal life. So what does, he, what does he equate here? He equates this, the person who is born again, the one who has their human identity reinstated is the one who is born again because they look upon the Son of Man on the cross and say, yes, I believe that. I trust that. That will create for me righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 
the things the cry of my heart really want, that will do it. That's what it means. And then he goes on to give the, the famous passage, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. They stand with a, with a confused and a corrupt identity because they still live there. They're not yet in the reinstatement and what we're just gonna see in a minute, restoration of the way human identity is meant to be because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So Jesus Christ comes on the scene and he reinstates human identity. So much so that the apostle Paul, when he writes about this concept later, says, I have been crucified with Christ. Look, listen to the I. Listen to how he describes himself. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness, being found right with God, being made okay with God, could be gained through my human performance, then Christ died for nothing. That's not how it works. He has become for me wisdom from God, my righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He is that, and I look to him. And so my identity then becomes about Jesus and who he tells me I am, not about me wanting to be equal and say I can do this on my own. That's the sin of the garden. Okay? Now I quote the Pope here. He says it this way. The question of identity is not who I am, but whose I am. Who is the one outside of me that is gonna tell me who I am? Jesus Christ. He's the one. He tells you. Now, he closes this section, and he gives a little, he calls it a thought experiment. I want to read it. Uh, it's a great thought experiment because it helps you to understand how influential outside sources are upon us. He says this. He says, imagine an Anglo-Saxon warrior in Britain in AD 800. He has two very strong impulses and feelings. One is aggression. He loves to smash and kill people when they show him disrespect. Living in a shame and honor culture with its warrior ethic, he will identify with that feeling. He will just say to himself, that's me. That's who I am. I will express that. The other feeling he senses is same-sex attraction. To that he will say, that's not me. I will control and suppress that impulse. Now, he says, fast forward that. Imagine a young man walking around Manhattan today. He's the same two inward impulses, both equally strong, both difficult to control. What will he say? He will look at the aggression and think, this is not who I want to be, and I'll seek deliverance and therapy and anger management programs. He will look at his sexual desire, however, and conclude, that is who I am in, in today's culture. For us to say that we're free from culture is ridiculous, that we're free from outside sources defining our inward impulses. He would argue it doesn't even make sense in, our, in, in someone who would not hold necessarily to biblical values. So, what does this thought experiment show us? Primarily, it reveals that we do not get our identity simply from within. Rather, we receive some interpretive moral grid, lay it down over our various feelings and impulses, and sift through them through it. This grid helps us decide which feelings are me and should be expressed and which are not and should not be. So this grid of interpretive beliefs, not an innate, unadulterated expression of our feelings, is what shapes our identity. And what I'd like to propose to you today is what if, what if we let the outside source of defining who we are be God? What if we said, God, your thoughts and your ways and what you say about me, that will be the thing that will define me. And then that's the filter. That's my filter. So, as we close, let me, uh, let me give you a couple things to think about. First off, what do I need to filter through what God says to be true about my identity and my worth? And then, and then lastly, uh, 
How about how I view others? And what God thinks of others? Let's pray together. Lord, I know that this particular water of which we swim in is very prevalent. I know it's very prevalent with me and I'm sure with everyone here. It is something in which we struggle with all the time. So I ask God that you would allow us to be excellent filters, that we would use your word and your truth and we would hold to them dearly as we think about what it means to be who we are, who you've made us to be, what our identity is, and that the self is very important, but it's not sovereign. It, it lives best when it's in complete and utter dependence upon you. So God, we don't wanna be like God in that way where we're equal. We wanna be your image. We wanna be your shadow. And we wanna point people to the real mountain. I pray for that, God. I pray for some folks in this room for the maybe for the very first time in their lives, they heard the phrase, you must be born again. That you must step out and look to the one on the cross and say yes. I pray for those in this room and I hope Wes and anyone hearing this online, if that's not them, that right now, right now they would just stop wherever they are and say, Jesus Christ, I need you as Savior. I need you as Lord. I need you as the guide for my life. Come, take residence within me. I pray for that, God. And I pray, Lord God, for those of us who wrestle deeply with defining ourselves by what we do and how we are, that we would let Scripture do the work to give us the true identity, that we're valuable because you say we are, we're valuable because we're made in your image and that we reflect you and that you cared enough for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that those who believe in him shall never perish. God, would that be the thing we cling to, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.